I'd like to welcome our online worship audience. It's great to have you with us. We pray that you will be blessed today by uh, our service. Today we're uh, looking at a very difficult subject as I continue my series on relationships on the rock. Today we're going to look at the subject of abuse. Uh, next week will be the last in the series, and that will be the most important thing in relationships, so you don't want to miss that in case you've got it wrong, okay? Uh, the most important thing in relationships. And then after that, I'll begin my uh, final series with you. Uh, it's just entitled, It's Personal. And uh, we'll cover subjects such as uh, my relationship with God, your relationship with God. It's very personal. And your relationship with each other, it's personal. Your relationship with the world, it's personal. And the final message, and Sherry will help me with this final message, is my relationship with you. Uh, it's very personal. So um, today uh, we're approaching a very difficult subject. When I was uh, in seminary, or actually my ordination, which was in Colorado Springs, <clears throat> 1979, at the annual meeting, uh, one of the directives that they gave us is they were saying, this is what we expect from you as ordinands, as uh, young men and women who will be ordained in the covenant church, is um, that you will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and you'll preach the whole gospel. You won't leave anything out. You won't just pick the happy, you know, lighthearted subjects. You won't just talk about love and grace, all good, but you'll talk about the difficult subjects as well. And so that's what brings us to today. When, it, when we're talking about relationships, we recognize that in marriages, in families, and in all sorts of relationships in the world, there is abuse. And there is people that are less than and people that have power over instead of power under. And we're going to be talking about these kinds of relationships today and look at what God's Word has to say about this. So if you will just... Uh, Join me for a brief prayer as we begin this morning. Father, um, as we begin this message, I pray that you would, that your Holy Spirit would simply um, dwell in this building and in the homes of all those who are listening, and that as the Spirit of God, you would move among us, uh, that you would touch our hearts, that you would move us, that you would cause us to hear your word and to respond recognizing that the power of the gospel can transform a life. My prayer is that each of us would not only be warned about things that are very difficult, but be inspired about the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first church I served in uh, San Diego, California, after seminary, was Mount McGill Covenant Church in Spring Valley. And um, it was a great church, and my first church was very exciting. About a year after we had been there, uh, the chairman of our church said that, uh, he was a financial guy, he said, you know what, you guys need to buy a house, because I came out of seminary with no debt, but also with no money. So he said, let the church kind of help you with a, um, you know, equity sharing loan uh, to get you in your first house. So we got into our first house in 1979. The price of that house was $79,900, right? You can't buy a car hardly for that these days, but so that was our first house. And our neighbor, these houses were brand new. Our neighbor moved in next to us, and it was a single mom by the name of Carolyn. And Carolyn had a little boy by the name of Christopher, and Christopher was five years old, and our youngest son, Tyler, was five years old. And so they became best buddies uh, they went to school together, they played together, they were BFFs, they were just great together. They had a wonderful time. Carolyn, on the other hand, was very reluctant to join into a relationship. Uh, if you know Sherry, you know that uh, you have to be pretty cold to not have a relationship with her. But Carolyn was very um, distant. And we tried, we invited them over for dinner, they came, uh, we had different talks but she was very, very distant. And uh, so we continued and we had a decent relationship, but it was never really that committed on either side, it seemed. Well, uh, a few months later, um, and we invited Carolyn to church many times. She let Christopher go to Sunday school with Tyler, but she didn't go. She said, no, I'm, I'm, I believe in God, but I just don't go to church. Okay, no problem. We still wanna be your friends, and uh, so we were. 
So a few months later, she called me at the office and uh, asked if she could have an appointment with me. And I said yes. And so we met a couple of days later. And Carolyn said, I just want to tell you my story so you kind of know where I'm coming from, why I feel so kind of distant. Uh, she said, I grew up in a uh, missionary family. And uh, my dad was a very well-known missionary in a particular uh, missionary conference and uh, was a speaker all over the world. And, um, you know, everybody loved him and he was amazing and it was great. She said, but it wasn't so great at home. She said, from age four until I went away to college at age 17, my father sexually abused me. And my younger sister, my father always said, if you don't do what I tell you to do, your younger sister is next. So she said all those years, she had a sense of her, I mean, you try to find a sense of who you are in those situations, and she had a sense that she was rescuing her sister. Well, she grew up very damaged, as you would expect. Um, her father um, never admitted to the day he died that uh, he never asked for uh, forgiveness, for, asked, never gave an apology. A few years later, Carolyn, after that happened, uh, Carolyn blew the whistle, and finally he was prosecuted and uh, put in jail, but uh, never reconciled uh, with her. Uh, she got married. As you would expect, the marriage failed. Out of that marriage came this beautiful little boy, Christopher, and that's where we found her. Um, now, I'm going to stop the story there, but I will finish the story at the end of the message because you need to know that even in a dire situation like that, uh, there is hope. The scripture is very clear that people that are on the outside of you, of me, people that are different, that are other, people that are broken, discarded, abused, used, those people really matter to God. Uh, Luke 15, you know, lost coin, lost sheep, lost son. Those three parables are all about the same thing, that lost people, broken people, hurting people, really matter to God. And that's what this uh, message is about today. So there's, unfortunately, and I hate to say this, but there is a lot of abuse in our world, especially in the United States, and even a lot of abuse in the church. So let me just share with you some statistics. These will be startling to you. Um, years ago, the S Surgeon General, C. Everett Koop, some of you remember him, before he passed away, uh, stated that domestic, domestic violence perpetrated by males accounted for more adult female emergency room visits than traffic accidents, muggings, and rapes combined and is the single greatest cause of injury to American women. He declared it as a national health crisis. Recently, our current uh, Surgeon General, Susan Orsega, affirmed that these statistics are not only true, but they are even more so today. One in three to four women will experience abuse, rape or physical assault in their lifetime, 27%. Many suggest that number is low. One in six men will experience physical abuse in their lifetime, 16%. 26% uh, of marriages contain physical violence. 50 to 56 contain abuse in some form. One in three teens and at young adults, college students, will experience physical abuse in dating relationships, 32% approximately. Other forms of abuse increase the m number, and some studies say that is as high as 70%. There is a, an epidemic of teen rape in our country. 44% of women in domestic abuse relationships are raped by their abuser. Some studies estimate the rape occurs as many as 70% of these relationships. Divorce rate for a non-abused woman is 15%. The rate for an abused woman is 75%. It is estimated that over 3.3 million of American children witness intimate partner violence, P IPV, within their families. What's saying violence, by the way, is a long-term physical and mental health problem, including alcohol, substance abuse, and being a victim of abuse as well for these children. One million children suffered abuse and neglect in the U.S. in 2006, according to the National Child Welfare Information Gateway. 
40 to 60 percent, 40 to 60 percent of children living in homes where adult abuse occurs also experience direct abuse themselves, all experience indirect abuse. 50 per, 90 percent of women inmates report having experienced sexual, emotional, or physical abuse before incarceration. And people with strong religious beliefs such as us stay longer in abusive relationships because it gets messed, mixed up with their faith beliefs. And finally, abusers are more likely to go, to help, go for help when their pastor says so than if someone else says to go, even a court order. In other words, the church needs to speak out on these issues. Sadly, religion is not a deterrent. There is just as much abuse, spousal, child, and sexual abuse in Christian homes as in non-Christian homes. These statistics to me are overwhelming, disturbing, and demand a response from the Church of Jesus Christ. Now here at Grace, and all of you already know this, one of our highest values as a church is to share the transforming love of Christ with those in our church, in our community, and in the world. And of course, for most of us, the first place we learn about love and Jesus is in our homes and families. And we learn what love's warmth, security, acceptance, and encouragement does. We learn love's patience. We learn that forgiveness is a huge act of love. And we learn about the many challenges in our families. And the majority of families, it works. Not perfectly, but it works. Love reigns most of the time. But there's a dark secret in the world and in the church. A silent reality, an abuse of power, hurt, and yes, even violence. Today I want to make you aware that some families, many families, more than likely some families in this room, are hurting deeply and are infected with abuse and violence that stops growth, stops love, stops joy, and stops life. It may not always involve physical violence, but power, control, and abuse come in all kinds of forms, physical, verbal, psychological, financial, even spiritual. And the rest of us, and I cannot say this strongly enough, the rest of us will not ignore it. We need to be offering hope and health in place of hurt and pain. Hear this. As followers of Christ, we need not only to strengthen our families with the life-giving love of Christ, but also offer hope and healing to those impacted by the deep pain of domestic violence. We are the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, a place to be saved and a place to be safe. If there are those who are being hurt in our midst, we will not tolerate it. And we will be used by Christ to bring healing. We will come out from the darkness. We will hold accountable perpetrators. We will bring hope and healing to those who have been abused. We will not stay silent. Well, what does God's word say about this? Now, when we talk, look at these scriptures, I want you to remember that it's not just domestic violence that we're talking about, but all sorts of evil that's perpetrated in our world that puts one person under another person, power over, power under. The one thing that Jesus fought about for the entire four Gospels that you read about this, now he didn't use this language, but he used the language in the Sermon on the Mount and other places that we are not to gain power over another person. Whether that person is a different color, a different sex, a different race, a different sexual orientation, we don't put ourselves over another person. That's power over. That's where we see governments. That's why we have wars. That's why we have race wars. That's why we have riots, because there's power over. Jesus came and said, no, it's got to be reversed. It's power under. And the way he showed power under is by washing the feet of the disciples. And when he was done, he said, Do you, have you seen what I've done right here? Because uh, Peter, J not, Peter James and John were arguing about who's going to be first in the kingdom of God while he was washing their feet. They were arguing about who's going to be at the right hand of Jesus. Jesus said, do you understand what I'm doing here? I'm showing you leadership. I'm showing you power. I'm showing you how to lead by washing your feet. Do you understand this? 
And the disciples kind of, oh, yeah, I think so. He said, then go and do likewise. Power under is the source that we receive from Jesus. So I'd like to read you some scriptures now. These first several are from the Old Testament, and then we're going to look at a New Testament story that Jesus told. And each of these have to do with everything we've been talking about. Domestic violence, violence in our society against people that are different, people that are we consider weird or strange or other or them. All of those categories of people, abuse towards them, Jesus speaks to them. Listen to Ecclesiastes 4.1. The writer of Ecclesiastes, we don't know who it was, uh, he was basically just known as the preacher. That was his nickname, the preacher. Ecclesiastes 4.1, listen to this. Next, I turn my attention to all the outrageous violence that takes place on this planet. The tears of the victims, no one to comfort them. The iron grip of oppressors, no one to rescue the victims from them. I mean, he's saying, I want you to stand up for mercy and justice. God help us to help God rescue the victims. Now, another area that we've seen this a a year ago, May 26th, 2020, as you know, George Floyd was killed. And that started an uprising in our country that we haven't seen since 1964. And it was incredible, and it was amazing, and it was sad, and it was violent, and it was this racial racial tension that we're still feeling somewhat today. I remember uh, shortly after this, we had a Zoom call with all of the pastors of the Evangelical Covenant Church. One thing that I'm very proud of is how diverse, in fact, our denomination, the Evangelical Covenant Church that came from Swedish Lutheran roots, is the most diverse diverse, um, uh, organization in Protestant churches anywhere, most diverse. We have over 75 African-American churches. We have Asian churches. We have many Hispanic churches, especially in California. And so we're very diverse, and we have a lot of uh, churches that are multi-ethnic. So we have a lot of diversity in our our, uh, denomination. So we had this Zoom call with all the lead pastors, and uh, everybody was talking about this racial tension. We were especially listening to our black brothers and sisters and what their experience was. And I remember this one friend of mine from Detroit, a wonderful uh, Christ follower, wonderful pastor. He said... He said to all of us, basically white people, he said, listen, I know you are not racist. I know that. I know you. He said, but that's not enough. It's not enough to be not racist. You have to be against racism. You have to speak up. You have to say no. You have to do the right things to make this thing work. Because most of us in here would say, hey, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. But what he was saying is that you don't understand the black experience. We feel this. Every time we see a light, a a red light flashing behind us, we are terrified. You and I are just saying, oh man, that's going to cost me 200 bucks, right? So, but there's a whole different way of looking at it. And it made so much sense to me that I can't just be not racist. I've got to be someone that stands up for righteousness, that stands up for the right thing. That's what we're talking about in this passage. We can't just say, I'm not sexist. I'm I'm against domestic violence. I'm not racist. That's not enough as Christ followers. Jesus, the way he lived his life was always sticking his nose into other people's business. (laughs) Always doing the right thing, even when it was going to cost him dearly. And that's what he is calling us to do. God help us to help God rescue the victims. Isaiah 33, 15. The answer is simple. Live right. Speak the truth. Don't be silent. Speak the truth. Despise exploitation. Refuse bribes. Reject violence. Avoid evil amusements. This is how you raise your standard of living. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? This is how you raise your standard of living. A safe and stable way to live. A nourishing and satisfying way to live. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ, we are called to despise exploitation. I want to love the things that Jesus loves, and I want to hate the things that Jesus hates. And one of those is exploitation, whether it's in home or in the world, right? We are to reject violence. We are to provide a safe and stable way to live for families in our church, for people around us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news of salvation, deliverance from sin, but also 
having a safe place for all people, especially for women who have been abused. And then selected verses from Proverbs 21. Listen to this. Verses 3 and 4 and then verses 12 and 13. Clean living before God and justice with our neighbors mean far more to God than religious performance. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Some of us are saying, I'm pretty good at religious performance. I'm pretty good at doing the do's and not doing the don'ts, right? But he's saying here, living before God and justice with our neighbors mean far more to God than religious performance. Verse 4, arrogance and pride, distinguishing marks in the wicked are just plain sin. Verse 12, a God-loyal person will see right through the wicked and undo the evil they have planned. Notice that, undo the evil. Don't sit back and say that's wrong. Undo the evil they have planned. And verse 13, if you stop your ears to the cries of the poor, your cries, your cries will go unheard, unanswered. Hear the cries of the hurting, of the poor, of the abused. Lord, help us Lord, help us not to stop our ears. And then Proverbs 31, 8. Speak up for the person, for the people who have no voice, for the rights of all the down and outers. Speak out for justice. Stand up for the poor and the destitute. In the first century, uh, the Roman government allowed, well, you've heard of patria potestas. That's where the, the father has rights over the children and over the wife to do with them whatever he pleases. Okay, that was the Roman. And remember, this was, this was the Roman Empire. <laughs> this is a lot of people in a lot of places. And what they would do, if you had a, a, too many girls, too many baby girls, you'd take one of them or a couple of them down to the river and leave them there. And then animals would come and take care of your problem. If you had deformed children, if you had children who were mentally retarded, somehow physically unable, elderly people, people who were uh, unable to help themselves, you know, whether they're physical disability or something else, you take them down to the river and let the animals take care of the job. The only group of people that rescued those people was this young, burgeoning movement called the Way, the movement of Jesus Christ. No one else, no other religious organization, not the Jewish community, no one else would rescue these people. But Christians recognized the value that God places on every human being, every human being as pure and righteous and good. And the Christians, they had no money, they had no resources, they had no leverage, but they went down and they rescued these people and these children and they became part of the Christ community. Speak up for the people who have no voice, for the rights of the down and outers. Speak out for justice. Stand up for the poor and the destitute. And then the last verse from the Old Testament, which is the most powerful, comes from, Isaac, from Amos, the book of Amos, the minor prophet, chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. This is what the Lord is saying to the church then, to the, uh, the temple worship then, and what he's saying to us today. I hate all your show and pretense. The hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your bird offerings and grain offerings. I won't even take notice all of your peace, choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. God was speaking very clearly to the Israelites about how they were all wrapped up. Remember in Jeremiah, you know, the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord, the house of the Lord. And they were all wrapped up in all of their religious ceremonies and yet they were doing exactly what the Romans did. They were just saying, these people over here don't matter and these people don't matter and people outside of the Jewish commander really don't matter and Samaritans don't matter and no one matters except us. And Jesus said, no, that's not the way we're going to do things. He emphasized that over and over. A mighty flood of justice. Endless river of righteousness. We must stand on the side of God, righteousness and justice. We cannot stand around and pretend this injustice occurs, does not occur, whether it's domestic violence or anything else. 
God says through a megaphone, it's everybody's problem who is righteous and godly. Don't sit back and say, I'm not that. I was at, uh, oh, I was in college, so probably late 60s. Um, my dad and I got uh, season tickets to the San Diego Chargers. Now, the Chargers have been around San Diego since 1961. Now they're in some other place. I have no idea. But uh, anyway, uh, my, we got season tickets. And to tell you how different things were in like 1968, 69, uh, the tickets, I remember that book, booklet of eight tickets I had, $6.50 for each ticket to a professional football game. Okay? It's changed a little bit. Anyway, we got tickets, and my dad was this uh, huge peanut guy, so every uh, quarter I had to go down and get four bags of peanuts, and uh, so I was down there getting some refreshments, and there's this mob of people, and I, I could yelling and screaming, and so you know what's happening when you're like at a game or something, uh, too many young men consuming too much alcohol, and they were, and they're yelling and screaming, and there were probably 50 people around in a circle, and I looked in there, and it was obvious to me that this was, this is a real problem, and so what I saw was a young man in his 20s, my age, right, and he was over an older man, I thought older at the time, he was probably in his 50s, he's not so old now, but, and he was pounding him like this, and he was already unconscious. He was going to kill this guy because it was a concrete floor at Jack Murphy Stadium. And he, he, literally, he was going to kill him. And, and I busted through, I didn't even think about it, I busted through the crowd and I grabbed this kid and I threw him off like that and I knelt down over this guy and do and, and you know what happened? Three guys jumped me because I interfered with that. Now, thankfully, the cops got there and settled things. I still don't know to this day whether or not that man survived or not and whether or not the other man was actually uh, held accountable for that. But let me tell you something. It's hard to get involved. It's hard to say no when there's unrighteousness happening, especially in the home. It's hard to do that. But God is telling us very clearly, we are not the type of people, Christ followers are not the type of people that say, somebody should go down to the river and get that baby. We're the ones. Right? Remember that speech Mother Teresa gave at Bill Clinton's inaugural prayer breakfast? She talked about abortion and all the Democrats in there going, oh no, you know. And, 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 she, and she, said, she, she said, what should we do? Mother Teresa said, what should we do? I'll tell you what we should do. Give them to me. Give those babies to me. I'll take them. Now, she was speaking, of course, figuratively, but she was absolutely right on. The Christian community, when, when it comes to these kinds of things that are unrighteous, we have to stand up and say, I'm going to do something. I am going to do something because this is Christ's work. Be a voice for the voiceless. Say no to acts of wickedness and violence. Don't stay in the shadows. By the way, Carolyn, I started this message with Carolyn's story. Carolyn's mother was the greatest pain in Carolyn's life was the silence of her mother. Now, years later, um, they re reconciled, she and her, even though she and her father never reconciled, she and her mother reconciled because her mother finally said, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't want to deal with it. I couldn't deal with it. My husband was out preaching to thousands of people, so I just kind of went like this. God says, I turn my attention to the outrageous violence. So should you as Christ followers. So then an amazing story from the New Testament, and you're all familiar with this. The story of the Good Samaritan, which is a funny, that wasn't the, actually the name that was given in the Bible, that's what, the name that we've given it, which is kind of funny, because Samaritans were never known as good, <laughs> good for anything. They were half-breeds, half-Jewish, half-Gentile, and uh, really hated by both groups. And so they kind of were, you know, on, on, on their own. So here, here's the story uh, that you need to hear uh, from the Scriptures. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. By the way, listen to some nuances as I read this passage, uh, some things maybe you haven't heard before. So a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho uh, when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. 
And then he put the man on his own dock. He took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, let me stop right there. He took care of him. The next day, what does that mean? Spent all night with him, right? Spent all night with him. The next day, he took, took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these, now Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, right? Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? At this point, you've got to think that the, you know, the, the religious leaders and the, uh, they're kind of backing away, but Jesus gets one of them, gets his attention. He says, which of these uh, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. I'm sure he said it that way too. The one who had mercy. In other words, I am caught, I am trapped, and Jesus told him, go and do likewise. By the way, that go and do likewise is the exact same Greek words that Jesus used after he washed the feet of the disciples and told them that they were supposed to serve the way he served. Go and do likewise. In fact, that's our call. Ever since God, Jesus has said to you, follow me. By the way, in the Bible, it never says come and accept Christ, come and receive Christ. Those are all good words, but it's always follow me. So it's not a matter of just saying, saying the prayer, you know, okay, I'm good to go. No, follow me, follow me. And then the thing he says to us after that, have you seen what I've done? Have you seen how I've lived? Do the same thing. Treat people the same way. Treat the outcasts the same way. People that people have different colored skin, people that are of a different race, people that are of a different sex, all of it, you treat them the way I have treated them. What an amazing story. So here's a priest. The most influential man in the Jewish community, the priest. Best education, highest salary, lives in the nicest homes, has the best clothes. I mean, everything's, everything's cooking for this guy. He comes along, this man, and maybe his first thought was something like this, oh man, this guy is naked, and I'm a priest. I can't be around this kind of debauchery. I can't, so he crosses to the other side of the road, and he's beat up, and he's bloody, and I can't touch, he's probably a Samaritan, I can't touch him, I can't, besides, I've got important things to do at the temple. I've got to preach a sermon, and I've got to lead the choir. And I've got to use the mimeograph machine, right? I've got, I've got all this stuff. I, I've got important religious stuff to do. I cannot mess with this man. Shortly after, a Levite comes along. Well, oh, who's a Levite? A Levite is like an associate pastor. It's like a church administrator. Uh, he's the guy that, he said, listen, I, I can't stop. Again, he's naked and he's bloody. I can't touch him. I can't be around him. He's probably a Samaritan. And I've got, I've got to make sure that the, the candles are ready, that the, the, the wicks are clipped. I've got to remember, I've got to get the gold candlesticks out and put them in the right, I've got, to do, I've got important stuff to do. I'm an important man. I cannot mess with this. And then a Samaritan comes along. He's already a loser, right? And yet this one loser looks at an almost dead loser that's naked and bleeding. And the Bible says he took pity on him. Maybe because he'd never received pity himself. Maybe because nobody has ever really showed him love. That somehow he wants to show this man love. And he does. What an amazing story. A story about really one thing. Don't walk away. Don't walk away. I know it's hard. It's complicated. Difficult. Don't walk away. If you know someone that is being abused in a home, a woman, don't walk away. Do something. You see somebody that's acting in a racist behavior, don't walk away. Say something. Do something. See, those who talk about religion almost always walk by. Those who are busy doing God things, and remember what God things are. God things are broken people, lost people, hurt people, abused people. These are God things. The broken, the despised, the poor, the oppressed, the abused. These are the ones that matter. So um, last week, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, a friend, uh, another pastor in the area up here in Oro Valley. 
and his name's Joe, and Joe told me the most amazing story that happened to he and his family just four weeks ago. So uh, Joe and his wife have four children, two older children, and then two younger children who are adopted. Their youngest is a five-year-old African-American boy who is severely autistic. And, and Joe says, he's a rascal. He's always finding ways to escape in the house. He's nonverbal. He doesn't say anything. He's very loud at times, you know, screaming and yelling, and, but, you know, he's nonverbal, so you don't really know what he wants. And uh, Very severe, but they love him with all their heart. And Well, this one particular day, an 18-year-old daughter was watching him. Mom and Dad were gone. And uh, somehow this little guy got out of the front door, even though there's three locks, right? He figured out how to get up on a st stool and unlock it. He got out the front door. The sister noticed the dog out front, and the dog is never out front unless the front door is open, saw the front door was open, and her little brother had vanished. Five-year-old, early May, very hot, no shoes, no shirt, just a little pair of shorts, and a little African-American boy running around, obviously in distress. The only thing he's yelling is truck, because he wants to see a truck. He's running through the neighborhood, None of the neighbors that see him, that walk by him, say or do anything. They just walk by. Not my problem, right? This little boy gets out into a golf course. He's crossing over to get to La Choya. And what is he going after? He's going after a truck. And little children that have severe autism have no guardrails. They don't know what danger is. And Joe said he would have run right out into the street to chase a truck and been killed instantly. So he's running across, and he goes by, they estimate about 10 different foursomes playing golf. And the mom and dad come up, the mom's screaming, she's in tears. Have you seen my son? Have you seen my son? I said, well, we saw a little guy run over that way, but, but I don't know where he is now. And he's going, yeah, good luck, you know, that kind of a thing. And this happened over and over and over again. No one stopped and said, get in my cart. I'll take you. We're going to go find this boy. No one did because what? Their golf game was more important. Finally, a young man in the neighborhood, home eating lunch by himself, saw the little boy streak by. He went out, he ran after him, ran him down, and grabbed him before he could get onto La Choya. Grabbed him and held him. And little boy, you think he might scream and say, who's this stranger? All he said was, truck, <laughs> truck, truck, truck. And this, this fine, then the parents got there, the police got there, and thank God the little boy was rescued. But who are all those people? Who are all those people that stood by and said, yeah, somebody should do something about that? A little black boy running around with no shoes on. This obviously, just, somebody should do something about that. Yeah, there's somebody should do something. And that young man did exactly that. They had to kind of a reunion. The young man uh, finally found out who the parents were and got connected with them, and they had a little uh, thank you and all that. But isn't that a, an amazing story? And Joe said the worst part about it was the dozens of people who did nothing. Friends in Christ, we're not going to be that. As a church of Jesus Christ, as individuals, we are not going to be that. We are not going to be the church that stands by. If somebody's experiencing domestic abuse, we're going to say something. We're going to do something. If somebody's experiencing some other kind of abuse, we're going to say something. We're going to do something. Because we are called to be, what? The one who had mercy in the story. The one who had mercy. It is Christ's work, and we are called to stand in the gap, to say no to violence and oppression. We are called to be the one who had mercy. So I'm going to close with just a couple of thoughts about what can we do. It's easy to say it's wrong. We know that, okay? We feel it instinctively. We know it. The Bible's very clear. It's wrong. What can we do? The first thing is this. Be aware. If you know of, maybe you've experienced it, or you know of someone that has experienced it, if you're aware of domestic abuse, violence, it's a real issue, and it's a long-term issue. It happens. It happens now. It's happened in the past. Sometimes generation after generation because, what, everyone keeps silent. Everyone says nothing. We need to be aware that it is real, all kinds of abuse and violence. And, not just because, and it's not because, just because it's a social problem. Listen, it's not a social problem for us. It's a biblical justice problem for us. We're called to a higher standard for us. When someone is being oppressed, held back, overpowered by another person, 
That's what the Bible calls injustice, and we will be aware, and we will be alert to it. What can we do? Be alert, also be willing to break the silence. If you know of someone who is committing domestic abuse, if you know of someone who is doing something that is wrong, say something. Say something. The third thing is, we'll get you help. If you need help, if, if in a church like ours, most of us are, are you know, middle class white people. I understand that. But this is a silent killer. And if you or someone you know has been hurt, we will get you help. I promise you. You call me, you text me, you email me. We'll get you help. We have social workers in our church, teachers. And there's a, um, a Renee has a sheet in the back of the table by the communion cups. Uh, that's a resource sheet I put together for domestic abuse. If you are, have experienced that or know of someone, you take that resource sheet and it'll help you not only with you but with teenagers, okay? We will get the help you need. And the last thing is we'll find you a safe place. We'll find you a safe place. We've got an extra bedroom in our house in Chandler. We'll find you a safe place. If you're in danger, we will help. There's something more we can do as a church. We must always, as an authentic Christian community, model and live Christ's way and always use that same statement that I've told you for 16 months. What does love require? What does love require? Let me finish my message by telling you Carolyn's story, the end of Carolyn's story. So maybe six months after she invited Sherry and I into her heart, to tell us what happened. Uh, we just loved on her, and we just loved on her. And we kept inviting her to church, but no pressure. She finally went to a women's Bible study. I mean, she was familiar with the Bible. She grew up in a missionary's home, right? She was familiar with it. She, was, she, she, she didn't, I mean, she loved God, but she had that niggling question that anybody that's been hurt or abused has. If God loves me, why, right? I mean, that's a normal question. <laughs> We've all had that in our lives. And, and so over time, and you know my wife Sherry, Sherry loved on her, and finally she started coming to church and started getting involved and started receiving love and affection and started receiving grace and started receiving joy and acceptance and self-respect and value and hope and healing at Mount McGill Covenant Church. The bottom line is this, we cannot heal each other, but we can bring each other to a place of healing. The Church of Jesus Christ, I still believe with all my heart, in spite of all of its flaws, and besides all of its, its warts and everything, I believe the church is the hope of the world. I believe the local church is the hope of the world. It's where we receive love and acceptance and self-respect. Carolyn's life was dramatically transformed by the power of the gospel. She remarried. She had another child. She had a beautiful life. She had a deep love for Jesus. She was transformed. And there's hope like that for everyone who has experienced this kind of abuse. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, I realize that um, this kind of message is hard. It's hard to hear. <laughs> it's hard for me to talk about but it's so real and you were so real in facing every dilemma like this. You were so real at looking every abuser and abused person right in the eye and telling them what you thought and what you believed and telling them the, 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 the place that they can receive help and hope. Father, help us to be like Jesus. Help us to be the one who had mercy, that Samaritan man, the one who had mercy. And then Jesus, you told the Pharisee, go and do likewise. Father, may we go and do likewise and be the ones who show mercy. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.